here we are back on Monday morning at nine o'clock. This is uh, Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Jay Fidel. That's uh, Mike DeWork, Dr. Mike DeWork. He's our chief scientist here at Think Tech. And uh, uh -huh. we're talking about the approval of the Alzheimer's drug. Um, this is very important because there's a lot of people in this country that have or will have Alzheimer's and it's a very tragic experience, very hard on everybody involved. It's, uh, it's awful if you know anybody who has uh, somebody in the family who has Alzheimer's. It's progressive and ultimately it gets you. Anyway, Mike, um, we've all been waiting for news about Alzheimer's <laughs> drugs. Um, yeah. I know so many people, you know, who follow it. They want to know every step in the science. And now we have a step in the science, but it's a disappointment. Can you yeah. talk about it? Sure, sure. Yeah, I happen to be the uh, primary caregiver for a uh, Alzheimer's patient. Um, Alzheimer's disease affects something like 5 million people in the United States. Two thirds of them are women. Um, and uh, more than you know, two thirds of the caregivers are women. You know, when you talk about home health aides, daughters, sisters, wives, this is a this is a huge a huge problem, and it affects women disproportionately. Although it affects men too. Um, for the elderly Alzheimer's patients, about half the caregivers are husbands and half are spouses. When, when you look at spousal caregivers, so this this affects a lot of people. It's a devastating long term intensive debilitating disease. Um, average time to death from diagnosis is like 10 years, although some patients can live 20 with, with horrible disability you know, ongoing. So yeah, it's a serious, serious problem and it's getting, it seems to be getting worse. You know, there's some slight evidence that the incidence is starting to level off, that the incidence isn't growing exponentially the way it was. We'll see how that plays out in the coming years. Um, Risk factors include obesity, diabetes, um, pollution. Turns out sunlight, sun exposure. Um, so, well, we can go through the some of the uh, slides uh, and talk about some of the some of these issues. Um, okay, let's uh, do that. Are, are the slide, yeah. yeah, we have the first slide up. It's Adu Kanumab or Adu Helm, yeah. and it was approved. Yeah. And uh, that's your first slide. Yeah, that's the title. So on the I'll talk about at least one measurement of how you measure cognitive decline. Alzheimer's disease is a whole bunch of different ways to measure cognitive decline, um, and you can't use just one. Um, well, there's several systems for measuring uh, cognition in patients with dementia. Uh, MMSC, the Men Mini Mental State Exam, is one of them. There's a couple of flavors of it, the original one by Dr. Fulstein, so one that um, the Cochrane Committee, who looked at these uh, tests, you know, used. Um, there's a maximum score. It's a paper-based test. Simple questions like, what day is it? What time is it? What year is it? Where are you? Um, can you say a complete sentence? Can you remember a few words? Can you copy a drawing? Basic test of cognitive function. Uh, the maximum score is 30 points. The usual cutoff for dementia is 24, but that's very dependent upon the person and their history. If I scored 24, I'd be absolutely terrified because um, you know it, the cutoff should be higher for people with a higher educational level or people who receive good privileged care through their lives. Um, so it's a useful test, but it can't be used by itself to diagnose dementia. But where it's really useful is in determining the rate of cognitive decline, comparing someone from year to year and how their state is going. Um, for people with medium onset Alzheimer's disease, uh, it's about two MMSE points per year are lost. Um, and it's a subtle difference. Two points can be a subtle difference. Um, you would almost have to live with a person just to see just two points. Um, but that's, it, it's useful then. Um, so on the next slide, I'll show you one of the problems you have with doing Alzheimer's trials. The next slide should be saying uh, Alzheimer's seasonal variability. Mm -hmm. Tur turns out that you lose on an average two points per year, but the difference between summer and winter can be five years worth of decline. And the range is about two to eight years. Some people between the worst worst state in the winter and the best state in the summer show eight years equivalent uh, improvement. Um, and the, the, the overall trend over the long term is inevitably down. But that's um, it's seasonal effects pretty big, which means you have to do trials over many years to make sure you're seeing a real effect. Um, the aducanumab trials were seven and a half years, I mean, six and a half years, which is about what you have to do. 
um, and the effect is really large. Um, and, and this also might explain some of the anecdotes you hear about, oh, my auntie took this drug and my auntie felt better in six months. Well, when did she start taking it? You know, it really depends. You, you can't just use a few months worth of data because of the seasonal effect. So, but, but is this chart telling us that, that it's, uh, it's, it's less of a decline uh, in, in the, uh, the summer? In the in the yeah. fall and the, and the and the autumn and the and the, and the uh, winter or or yeah so in the cog spring? Mm -hmm. so okay so spring you hit your bottom it's like the it's like the weather the the uh, the climate lags the day length so you start to go up again uh, say in March or April you hit bottom in like March and then you start going up again as the days get longer and longer after the after the equinox and then over the summer your cognition improves and hits top sometime like September, typically, um, and then starts to decline again. So in the autumn, early autumn, you see a peak. In the early spring, you see the, the nadir. Um, mm -hmm. um, so, so there's a big sunlight effect. Uh, and so you've got to account for the seasonality when you do the trials. And so these multi-year trials, that's, they're expensive, they're lengthy. But that's what it takes. Um, the next slide, I talk a little bit about the geography, geographical effects of sunlight. It turns out that um, the, the closer you are to the equator, the less likely you are to get Alzheimer's disease, at least in the northern hemisphere. Southern hemisphere, there's fewer people, fewer trials. Trends are less clear. New Zealand, it's clear, but some other countries, it's less clear. But in, in the northern hemisphere, it's very clear. The farther you are from the equator, the more likely you are to get Alzheimer's disease. And it's not mediated by vitamin D. Because vitamin D supplementation seems to have very little effect unless you actually have a deficiency. So there's something else going on with sunlight or day length that's causing cognition to decline uh, if you don't get enough of it. Um, so if you do a clinical trial, you've got to have controls and test subjects match geographically as well as with time of year, as well as probably racially. Um, it turns out that, you know, because of the sunlight effect, the known uh, extra risk that African Americans have for Alzheimer's disease may partly be because of the sunlight exposure on the skin, but also may be caused by other things like poverty or health care, pollution, other known risk factors. But the point is you've got to match geographically and you got to match season-wise, and, <laughs> and you got to match ethnicity to do these trials properly. So that makes them very expensive, time-consuming trials. Um, mm -hmm. But lucky, lucky we live Hawaii. If you have to have Alzheimer's disease, Hawaii is probably one of the best places to have it because you have a lot of sunlight, you got good first-world health care, your decline will be a bit slower, uh, but still inevitable. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So let's. This is all background so far. So the next slide says amyloid plaque hypothesis, and in my opinion, it's failure. Um, uh, beta amyloid plaques are correlated with Alzheimer's disease. That's data. That's true. Uh, risk for developing dementia is twice as great with amyloid than it is without it. But the risk of developing dementia with amyloid plaques isn't 100 percent. A lot of people, even in their 80s, about 40 percent of people without dementia in their 80s have amyloid plaques, and they don't have dementia. 40% of the non-demented people have amyloid plaques without dementia. Um, so that's uh, an unproven hypothesis. And every drug that they've tried that can actually affect the amount of amyloid that they can test for in the brain, in the spinal fluid, has failed. Uh, it's failed to show clinical improvements in cognition, even when it has cleared amyloid. And in my opinion, these Aduhelm trials also failed or at least they have not proven what they're claimed to have proven. Um, so can I, have, uh, can I have Alzheimer's without having amyloid plaque? Uh, there are people who adamantly say, no, you can have dementia without Alzheimer's plaques. They will not call it Alzheimer's without amyloid plaques. Mm -hmm. So there's plenty of cases of dementia without amyloid, and therefore they don't call it Alzheimer's disease, mm -hmm. which yeah, to me, it just shows how ignorant we are of what the underlying real causes are. Um, I think that underlie other hypotheses, alternate hypotheses, 
need to be explored more. And other researchers are doing this. Professional Alzheimer's researchers are starting to do this. Um, the idea that amyloid may be a reaction to some other underlying cause of disease. For example, there's just been a recent paper that uh, pure iron and copper nanoparticles, which are known to be toxic, have been found in the brains of Alzheimer's patients. The hypothesis is that the amyloid plaques may be the brain's way to try to protect itself from these toxic metal nanoparticles. Hard to do the studies. It's a hypothesis that needs to be followed up. Um, there are other treatments um, that don't attack amyloid directly that have been shown to have a modest, small effect, like galantamine, which um, uh, it preserves acetylcholine, which is a very important neurotransmitter, has been shown to reduce the rate of Alzheimer's progression by about 10%. Which, so you're looking at two points per year versus 1.8 points per year cognition loss. It's a very small effect. But it is proven, and these acetylcholinase inhibitors are less side effects than the aducanumab that was just approved. Um, so in the next slide, I actually talk about these trials. This drug has to be given intravenously, medical supervision, of course. You can't just take it, put pills at home. It's got to be done intravenously. Um, benefits are only seen at the highest doses in the least impaired patients. So the average mini mental state examination score for patients that showed a benefit was 26. So that is sort of above the cutoff for Alzheimer's, but other tests you can do can say, oh yeah, this person's starting to show Alzheimer's. And of course they also tested for amyloid. So they knew they had amyloid plaques, which I could say is um, not necessarily going to always go to Alzheimer's, uh, dementia. So, um, so if this is an evolving story. Wikipedia article is getting updated almost daily. So, uh, that, so that's a good start, place to start for the source information. Ninety percent of the patients in these trials showed adverse effect, events. Um, some of them were very severe, like these uh, amyloid-related imaging abnormalities. Uh, they were required to do MRIs twice a year on patients getting. Well, they did it on both placebo and patients getting the drug. And if you showed these imaging abnormalities in your brain, which could lead to serious damage if they were allowed to progress, dosing was stopped for those patients. When the FDA approved this drug, they gave no guidance at all on MRIs and testing for these ARIA, these amyloid-related imaging abnormalities which I, in my view is a, just a gross ne negligence. Um, they also gave no guidance on the stage of dementia at which to give this drug, how to select the patients. Um, uh, and I, anyway, um, so there were two trials. They called them Emerge and Engage. They had about 1,600 subjects each. They were identically designed. Um, Engage the control or placebo patients declined slower than expected. That trial showed no effect, no statistically significant effect on cognition. Engage the control placebo effect declined faster than expected. It showed an effect, but only at the highest doses in the least impaired patients. And on top of it, they changed the high dosing regime partway through the trials so that the patients on the high-dose regime weren't exposed to the same dosage as the whole trial. Normally, you would use those data to say, let's do a whole new trial with the right dosing regime. And normally, you would combine these two trials to get better statistics. That's not what was done. They did a sub-analysis on just the engaged patients in the high-dose regime, and this has the appearance of cherry-picking to get a desired result. Mm. Yeah. The... The, the results are so ambiguous, the study is so, I, in, in my opinion, poorly done, that the FDA advisory committee voted 10 nothing to reject the approval of the drugs. Wow. They wanted them to go back and redo the trials at the dosing regime they were claiming had an effect. The top brass of the FDA overrode that recommendation. And why, that why did they override it? Let's go to the next slide. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so, oh, it's Adu Helm. It should be Adu Helm. Sorry about that. That should have been Adu Helm on that slide. Um, the uh, 
This drug costs $55,000 a year. So there's a big financial incentive for the company to sell it. Um, Medicare is not allowed to negotiate drug prices thanks to our wonderful Congress. So we're on the hook for it and they'll get that. Doctors get a, fra- a percentage of the drug price. So I, I, I don't know how many doctors will prescribe the drug out of financial motive. I hope none, but there is a financial motive here and a financial motive for bean counters and hospitals to try to get this drug into practice. Um, it, in my opinion, it takes money away from other treatments. But people are so desperate, so desperate for anything that might help with this disease that there was a lot of lobbyists on the side of the patient advocacy side pressuring the FDA to approve it, as well as, of course, the company pressuring the FDA for, you know, to approve it. What, what company um, is this, Mike? Uh, I, I'm not sure. I think it's Biogen. I, I'll have to look that up, though. Okay. Um, yeah. So the... Um, uh, is, but the, the benefits, even with generous interpretation of the statistics, because you give them the benefit of the doubt on the one trial that maybe that really high dose regime that they went to for part of the trial really will show an effect. Even with that generous interpretation, the benefits are modest. The risks are significant. <laughs> and, and this is probably a false hope. I, 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 really, I really think that this whole amyloid plaque hypothesis as the cause of Alzheimer's has to be questioned and other causes looked at. I I mean, they've been beating this amyloid plaque hypothesis horse for decades. And so far, there's been no, and in my opinion, not even this drug has been shown to do it. There's, There's another underlying cause for this disease that we have not yet sussed out and found a way to prevent or treat. Oh, by the way, it is Biogen. Biogen, okay. Yeah. Um, well, okay. I mean, this is this is not a this is not a pretty story. Now, of course, it's it really terrible to reject a, a ten to zero vote of your expert advisory committee. Um, but what's worth worse is that you're subjecting people to not only the cost, and that's like an awful architecture, um, but yeah. but also the risks of uh, side effects bad side effect, pretty serious right. business. And, you know, uh, it's just, it's an awful story. Um, you wouldn't yeah. use it. You yeah. wouldn't recommend it. Uh, and certainly from this discussion, yeah. I wouldn't either. But the, the problem right. here is this is this is the federal government. The federal government who, who uh, did whatever it did in the case of COVID. The federal government, yeah. uh, you know, who has done a number of drugs that m- maybe weren't so good. Now, we have all these protocols, all this science, all these very heavyweight guys who are there, um, you know, holding the public trust and approving yeah. drugs. And and the problem here is public confidence, don't you think? Right. I agree. I agree. I mean, they did such a good job with the COVID vaccines, making sure those trials were tight. You know, we had like 30,000 people in each trial, um, very low risk of side effects, very high efficacy. It did such a good job on that emergency approval. And this was not an emergency approval. This is a full approval for a drug that shows at best modest effects, serious side effects, very expensive. I I just the difference is astonishing between the two cases. But and, different organization, uh, right? This is this is the FDA rather than the CDC, right? Well, no, the FDA had to give the emergency approval for the vaccines. So it's the so, same organization. Uh, same organization. Um, uh, wow. So, uh, I mean, yeah, it's it, now the advisory committees. Uh, recommended approval of the vaccines once they saw the data. And the problem with this aducanumab is that originally they were going to not bother getting the approval because when they originally did the studies, they weren't showing any benefit until they changed the protocol halfway through and then did a sub-analysis on a subset of the data. So there aren't peer-reviewed papers out there yet for us to look at. Um, I would love to see the actual primary source peer review paper with all the data presented as it was presented for the vaccines for COVID. Um, I mean, so, it's just a very frustrating situation. Oh, sure. 
So, you know, I mean, you're not you're not the only one who's going through this kind of analysis. And I really wonder what kind yeah. of pushback there has been from the scientific yeah. community, the ones who yeah. look at the protocols and yeah. look at the internal workings yeah. and of the approval process. Uh, what yeah. what has come out? Well, three of the members of the FDA advisor committee just resigned to disgust. And there's been a lot of pushback from other researchers that, you know, this drug is expensive. It's not showing the benefit. The trials were not convincing. The trials should be redone with the protocol at the higher dose regime in place properly, et cetera. Um, uh, there's other drugs, like I said, galantamine does show an effect. Um, but it works differently. It works by preserving neurotransmitters instead of trying to attack amyloid. Um, I mean, the, it's a horrible, tragic situation that we're faced with Alzheimer's disease. But and there's a saying that a drowning person will grab the blade of a sword. Yeah. That's where we are. That's where we are. We're offering yeah. a, a sword instead of a life ring to people. And, and they're going to be injured. You, know, you think this uh, drug takes us further down the path? I mean, your description of um, you know what we know about the disease uh, leads me to believe mm -hmm. that we don't know that much. Um, yeah, we don't have I, a good yeah. handle on it. I would agree with you on that. I mean, I'm not a professional Alzheimer's researcher. I happen to read up on a lot because I'm a caregiver for an Alzheimer's patient, and I have some skills in terms of looking at peer-reviewed papers. Um, and I'm a scientist in a different field. But the, the thing is that um, we don't know a lot. I mean, there's so many different scoring regimes. Um, there's so many different staging regimes. We don't even know how to assess the stage of Alzheimer's disease properly. There's a whole bunch of different uh, methods for assessing how the progress of somebody and what the prognosis is. And it just shows how ignorant we are of what's really going on. Um, it's not like the periodic table where you can look at row column and say, yeah, that's the chemical property of that element. And that row, that column is probably this. Um, we just don't really understand this disease. It's what I understand from what I've read. And, uh, and I think the whole amyloid plaque hypothesis. Now, they're trying to salvage the amyloid plaque hypothesis by saying, oh, there is a subset of amyloid called oligoamyloid that is particularly toxic, but we can't test for it in a living patient. It's like, okay, if you can't test for it, how do you know that any treatment you give actually has an effect on it and then understand whether that effect shows up in the cognitive scores? So the gold standard shouldn't be amyloid in the brain or amyloid in the spinal fluid. The gold standard for this should be cognition. It's got to show a clinically significant cognitive benefit to be a treatment. So and, the, uh, I, I don't think yeah. this doesn't really take us down the path very far. In other words, um, I, my question is: Is there any value in this line of research, this line of this line of dealing um, with Alzheimer's, or is this just a yeah. you know a, a spurious bunny trail kind of exercise? I think, from what I can, under, when I read what I understand about the Al, the amyloid plaque hypothesis, it's, it's a bunny trail rabbit hole they've gone down. And unfortunately, we're going to find out by experimenting in, uh, on the population at large. If millions of people end up getting this drug out in clinical practice and they start reporting back progress and side effects, we're going to find out whether this drug, when you test it on millions of people, has an effect. If it doesn't, then that's, I think, the death of the amyloid hypothesis. I mean, they should just shut it down, that line of, re of investigation. Um, well, what about the government? I mean, we talked before about um, you know public confidence, and this is certainly not a statement yeah. uh, uh, in favor of public uh, confidence. If you were no, I agree. If you were running the FDA, um, what would you do here? If you were if you were a scientist, you know, uh, expert and dedicated to this field, what would you do? I, I guess there have been peer reviews that have criticized it, um, but query: What do we do when we find the FDA has made a gross error? Well, the FDA can rescind their approval or again modify it with a black box warning, um, or they can provide more guidance on MRIs and testing to make sure that the side effects are being monitored, um, none of which they did. Um, and there's been calls to the resignation of the top three people at the FDA who were responsible for this approval. Um, 
you got to you got to really follow the science. You 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 got to have rigorous science, especially when you're talking about something that millions of people could potentially be having to take as a drug. Um, what about overseas, that's Mike? Expensive. What, what about overseas? Um, I have I don't know. I haven't looked at any overseas trials. I don't know if they've sought approval in Britain or the European Union or Japan for this drug. Um, I would be stunned if the European regulators approved it. Um, they are as careful as the American regulators usually. So well, it's a very, very tragic um, story. And I wonder, you know, yeah, um, yeah. What, what is ultimately going to happen here? It sounds like it's going to be a bust. Um, and, what, and what it reveals, I think, in terms of the, the approval process is that we have a, a corruption, maybe a series of corrupt, um, right. corrupt phenomena that that work in this area. One is that Medicare thing where you know you can't negotiate with the drug company. Um, two, right. the drug companies, of course, have huge lobbying resources and they play that out yeah. all the time. <clears throat> and right. three, that you know that that it works even if the drug doesn't work. Uh, this is not a, a credit to Biogen for sure. Right, right. And it's not a credit to their executives for pushing this approval. Um, as opposed to starting a trial. Now, a trial is expensive, but, you know, people's lives are at stake. Uh, you could be generous with the FDA executives saying they were listening to the patient advocacy groups who were demanding something to help people. You could say, oh, it, but it's a misplaced compassion. It's a misplaced compassion in that this is a, an uncontrolled experiment now that going to be foisting upon these patients. Um, yeah. Do they ever have patients, trials after the drug is approved? <clears throat> they example, can. The, they can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I mean, it's like with the COVID. They continued the trials after the approval of the vaccines. Um, the problem was, so you can, they, could, they could continue the trials. They could do a new trial. Um, the problem is just giving it to patients is that only people who are showing symptoms of cognitive decline will take the drug, so there's no control. There's no control group to compare to, uh, really. I mean, because you got to do an intravenous infusion, all the circumstances are exactly the same, except one group gets a placebo, the other group gets the drug. Because, um, uh, you know, if you just get intravenous uh, infusion, that alone might give you a placebo effect that could, if you're in the early stages, help override some of the decline. Um, placebo effect is very powerful. Um, uh, so, yeah, the fact that this is an IV drug, that it's very hard to do, a, you, you, you've got to do a real controlled trial in a clinical setting to have it work. And, but now that the drug's been approved, who's going to sign up for a clinical trial where they might get a placebo? <laughs> right. That's just That's a good point. I, I, it's, just, just a, it's just a whole mess. And well, it enrages assume, me. Let's assume there yeah. was negligence in the approval process. Let's assume there oh, was a there was a corruption in the approval or a number of them. Um, is this the kind of thing that that could ever be subject to a a class a class action suit by people who oh, sure. will have been injured? Sure. I mean, uh, I, I don't know how protected the drug company is with the FDA approval. They're more protected than they would have been. Um, could they sue the government for approving it? Possibly. Um, that's hard. Um, however, I'm not a lawyer. Um, so not being a lawyer, I can't really state what the odds of a class action suit are. If people are injured by the side effects of this drug with it, you know, given how small its benefits are. Yeah. Oh, gee, it's very um, interesting. So yeah. I mean, from where we stand now, last question, where, where do you think this is going to go, both in terms of this drug and the name of it is Adu Kanamab, uh, and the street mm -hmm. name is Adu Helm. Um, Adu Helm, yeah. Where, where, where do you think it's going to go? And, and the other question is, where do you think, when all this shakes out, where do you think public confidence is going to be in the drug industry and in the uh, FDA and, and the National Institutes and the CDC and, you know, the government apparatus mm -hmm. for approving drugs? Yeah, this is... The yeah, this is a national tragedy because it, it will harm public confidence, um, especially if in clinical practice it really turns out that this thing has no significant clinical benefit and, and shows significant risk of harm. Um, I'm not recommending it for my dementia patient. Her doctor isn't recommending it to me uh, either. 
we're both appalled, uh, but there are other doctors in Hawaii who aren't so appalled by this approval, perhaps out of desperation for anything that might help. Um, my oh. thought is that, you no, know, I'm going to do what I'm doing to get my, my Alzheimer's patient out in the sun as much as possible, make sure she gets good nutrition because that's known to help. Um, try to manage the cognitive decline as best we can because um, uh, the decline right now is still inevitable. Um, uh, you know, I know some of these people, you put them in a, in a home or in a, uh, a nursing home where they never get outside to see the sun. Well, it's no longer, no wonder they're suffering faster cognitive decline. Some of these facilities seem designed to enhance cognitive decline. So treatment, managing the care is where we should be putting our resources right now until we get a better hypothesis and a better class of drugs that might actually treat the cause of the disease. We do not understand the causes of this disease. That's my takeaway. And we should really be focusing on treatment that better palliates, manages the symptoms and the uh, decline. And I'll tell you my takeaway from all of that is there are two problems that you describe that are, that are very troubling. Uh, one is that the, the, the drug, there's a disparity in the community on who gets Alzheimer's. I think that's clear, um, mm -hmm. racially, mm -hmm. uh, economically, and so forth. Yeah. And it's just right. another reason right. to be concerned, um, you know, that, there's, that these disparities exist and we can't seem to resolve them. Uh, that's a problem for, I'm sure, a lot of people. Um, and the other is, um, you know, we've just had this crisis. We are having this crisis over COVID. And you and I have spoken about it many times. And there's people who, you know, resist uh, taking the vaccine. They say, um, you know, that they have hesitancy. Some of them, some of them have uh, Trumpitis. Um, but, yeah. but the problem, the problem is that this is not going to help in Joe right. Biden's right. efforts to get people to relax and accept the advice of government because government has been nicked on this. And uh, yeah, I, I think, think it's that, been nicked. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and no, I agree. Other, I agree. Mm -hmm. The other, the other thing is that, you know, you're a scientist um, and you know, you're also a caregiver. So you're going to delve down as obvious that you have. Um, but what it tells us, if, if you're about to take a drug that you don't know about, or more to the point, that's a new drug, with new approval after tests that may you may find out are questionable or that are being questioned, uh, you read it. You better do your research, man. Um, if you don't do your research, you could be in the line of fire for something like this one, which I agree is yeah. tragic. So there's all kinds yeah, of fallout and I, I, from yeah. this. Yeah. yeah, and I'm lucky that I have the skills to do this research, uh, to understand the evidence. A lot of people don't. And a lot of people's caregivers, family members don't. So that's the real tragedy. They're going to be exploiting people who can't evaluate the evidence. Yeah. <sighs> well, thank you, Mike. This has been a very thank valuable you. discussion. I <laughs> certainly appreciate your work and your yeah. willingness to yeah. share with us. And I look forward yeah. to our next discussion together. Mike DeWork, yeah, our chief you, scientist. Jay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. Thank you. Aloha.